Hey everybody, it's the Trout, and welcome to another episode of the Trout Show. Thank you so much for stopping by. That music you heard by that fabulous violinist was a gal out of Vegas called Nina Di Gregorio. Wonderful violinist, and you know, most of the time when you think about violins, you think about symphony orchestra, but Nina takes it to another level. She started out, you saw it with electronic violin, but she's got all these great music. She started playing music a long time ago. Her first real job when she just got out of college was playing for the Wayne Newton Orchestra in Vegas. And since that time, she's developed it into a business where she has her own music. She has two other bands that she's put together and all of them are doing well because the music they play is phenomenally great. And I loved it. Nina takes solos, which she has on her YouTube video, and we talk about that, from famous songs like the one you just heard from The Who, Bob O'Reilly, and takes them and puts them on violin. And the way she does it is, well, let's just say she's very talented. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Nina and talking about electronic violin, how she got her start, and where she's going from here, because I think you'll like it on this episode, which is next on The Trout Show. Did you start out as a classical violinist and when did you start playing? I mean, when was the first time you said, oh, I, I got to play this instrument? How old were you? Uh, I actually never said that about the violin, which is the <laughs> funny thing. I, um, we had a piano in the home <clears throat> yeah. and I started crawling up to the piano, maybe two, three years old and picking out melodies on the piano. So I actually started uh, classical piano lessons at six years old. That was my first instrument. And then at nine years old, we had to choose an instrument in school that we wanted to play. And so they sent us a sheet and they said, pick your first, second, and third choice instrument. So I put okay. first choice, tenor sax, second choice, alto sax, third choice, barry sax. <laughs> so I was really into 1950s, early rock and roll music. Oh, where yeah. Sax solo and everything. Also, The Simpsons was really popular and Lisa played the saxophone, well, of course, but that was secondary <laughs> to me being a rock and roll fan. That's funny. So the band director calls me into his office and he says, you know what? You're really, really small. And I don't think you're going to be able to carry this saxophone to and from the bus every day. So why don't you play the violin? Because it's a lot lighter. And I said, OK. And that's how I started playing violin. <laughs> I did remember reading about your sax situation. I think that's on your yeah. bio or something like that. Yeah, and... so I, I wanted to be a sax player and ended up a violinist. When did you really get serious about it? I mean, you, what I you're think... doing in school, which is unusual. What, what, did you, what part of the country did you grow up in? I grew up in Western New York, uh, okay. about 30 minutes north of Buffalo in a town called Lewiston, New York. It's right on the Niagara River where the Niagara River meets Lake Ontario. Mm hmm and yeah, I played in the St. Catharines Youth Orchestra <clears throat> as a child in Canada because it was actually closer to where I grew up than Buffalo was. So every Saturday we drove over the bridge and went to Canada. Yeah, because you don't kids don't usually unless you get into high school or usually in college is when people start playing the violin in a van. You know, you have to have it unless it's a big high school, you know, they don't have strings so much. Yeah, we had, we were lucky. We had a good, strong music department where I grew up. And um, violin is one of those instruments that if you're not taking private lessons from a very young age, nine is late when I started violin. If you're not mm -hmm. starting at like three or four, you're just not going to be competitive. It's important for your body to be practicing and learning certain physical things while you're still growing. If you start them when you're done growing, I don't know if there's a chance you're ever going to be as good as when you start when your body's still small. So I, I played the guitar over 50 years and I'm one of those lead guitar player types. I picked it up occasionally and tried to play it. And it always sounds like a cat dying. <laughs> so <clears throat> I always think, ah, this could be easy. And then I go, no, here, take it back. Like I just, I don't, it's the whole radius of the, the fretboard. Well, there's no frets, but I mean the radius of that and then the strings and, and uh, I just tried it. So I have a, a real appreciation. When I was a kid, we went to symphony. They took us to see the symphony and that's really where I got exposure to it. And I thought, oh, I like this. Of course, that was back when the back in the Beatle days and all that stuff. So you, <clears throat> excuse me, you played guitar. Um, you know, that's what you did. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, uh, I picked up a little guitar at about 13 years old. 
Um, my dad had some fake books. He was kind of a just tinkered on guitar for fun. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd teach myself the chords by looking at the little diagrams, but I learned reading music. So that was always the strange thing because I was a classically trained pianist first at six years old. I learned to read music. Now, even to this day when I'm learning famous guitar solos that I'm sure the original player did not transcribe the notes no. for, that's how I <clears> learned <throat> them. I will listen to it, transcribe it into notation, and from that point, when I see it on paper, I can memorize it very quickly. Ah. Whereas when I learn something by ear, it will take me longer to memorize it. And I think it's because of just years and years of memorizing classical music from notes on paper. So that's probably. And, and even it's though it may be a sophisticated solo with a lot of playing, it's still just basically one note, you know, although where you're playing classical music, you got a lot of stuff going on there, you know, and, and, and I think, I think that, um, I believe people that play piano, especially classically, that you, I think there's a bigger understanding of how music works. You know, I just play by the ear. So, you know, I can read notes, but it take me a week to figure out all, you know, okay, FAC and all that stuff. So I just play it by ear. So when somebody does a solo like you do, and I'm listening to it, I've heard that solo so many times, or somebody does uh, Eric Johnson's Cliffs White, Cliffs of, Cliffs of Dover, and I know people that can play it note for note, I, I always wonder, okay, did they sit down and learn it all? But with you, it makes 100% sense because your mind works that way. Write it down, you know, but you got to be smart enough to figure it out, though. You have to have the skill to be able to write it down. I think that's just a skill from, like I said, learning classical my whole life and also going to college for music. I took a lot of theory courses and part of it is ear training. And so even when I'm not playing the violin, like, I don't know if you saw mine and my husband's cover of Limelight by Rush, but I played the, uh, Started watching it, yeah, I, did. Yeah. I played the bass, uh, yes, I covered Getty Lee's part and even learning that I transcribed his bass part note for note into notation and memorized it from reading the paper and then performed it. So I even learned a bass guitar part the same way I learned violin parts and, um, it helps because it, you know, you're not missing much when it's that way. It's like, oh, wait, what was that note? You don't have to go back and listen. You can just look on the paper and see, oh, that was the rhythm and the note. And then you memorize it that way. So I even learned his part classical style. That's, that's, I, I remember watching that because I was, oh, look, she's playing a Rick, uh, you know, playing a Rick. And, and that makes 100% sense if you have that, if you have that skill set. And I know, I did notice that you'd had, Going to college, you got a, several different kind of degrees, a bachelor's and, I mean, undergrad and master's. And, and people that tend to go to, you know, like if they go to school to get it, you get the theory a lot better. Guy like me that grew up playing, listen to people play, it's like, oh, okay, you just figure out how a song's put together. I was in a band once where the gal had perfect pitch, one of my singers had perfect pitch. And she would do that. She'd go, write, I'd write a song and she'd go, I don't know how to write it down. She goes, I will <laughs> you know, just listen to it and get all oh, there's the notes and all that stuff. I'm not so sure the theory <clears throat> part Excuse me. makes me any better of a performer or makes learning music any better than someone who doesn't have a background in theory. But what it does help me with is uh, part of what I will get hired to do or that I do for my own productions is write orchestral arrangements. And absolutely, when you're asked to write, can you write the string arrangement for this show? you need to understand how part writing works, how four part harmony works, how different mm. things can go to different places. And, you know, you don't want to, if you don't know the rules, you are writing stuff that doesn't necessarily work or make sense for a like a orchestral ensemble. So it's really helped me for my arranging skills and for my composition and writing skills, but I'm not sure it makes so much of a difference for performing really, because, um, I'm not playing like an instrument with chords all the time. So I, if I was playing yeah. piano, I would rely on my theory a lot more. Like I'm the solo instrument most of the time. Right. Um, <clears throat> do you, um, when you guys get together as a band and tour, do you write down everything that needs to be, I assume everybody in the band, the other ladies in there are all, they all can read music. I would assume they all can because they're playing violins, which I would make you know sense that they would. But here's a question I have for you. Can, if I said, let's do a jam, can you jam? Okay, so here's the thing. 
one violinist in a band, yes, you can jam. You ask four violinists to jam with oh, you, no, and no, it's no. just going to sound like noise. That's <laughs> no, where you need I, an arrangement. So yeah. that, like, people will ask it, well, well, why do you need like an arrangement to do a custom song with your group? Well, because if you don't give all four string players a part, everyone's going to be noodling and that's, that's a whole right. lot of noodling and you don't want to hear that. You want to hear like an arrangement that makes sense. So everything that I write for both of my groups, the Femmes of Rock, which is the touring group mm -hmm. and the Bella Strings, which is my corporate electric string group to backing tracks. They have very specific arrangements that make sense for four string players. And sometimes clients, they don't understand that. They're like, well, can you just give me like like four strings and I, I don't want to pay you to write an arrangement. So just, just they'll sit in with our band and they'll just play. I'm like, going to sound like garbage, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. not that they're not good players. Everyone's a good player, but yeah. if you put, you know, Eddie Van Halen and Jimmy Page and David Gilmour and all on stage together and just say, just do whatever, yeah. you know, it's like without figuring something out ahead of time, it's just going to be a lot of soloing going on. So over each other. Yeah. That's why when you watch uh, like the Crossroads events, they always say, you take it, you take it. You right. Know, and trading off solos is one thing, but yeah. if you want all of the girls playing at the same time, now you need an arrangement. Yeah. You got to have an arrangement. Work. Yeah. So when did, when did you get started? So you, you were a performer and then when did you come up with this idea of putting some ladies together and putting all that together to try to get, you know, the, how did that all get started? Uh, in middle school, when I was 12, wow. 13 years old, I had a group of friends uh, that played in the orchestra and, you know, they were all good players. Like at 12, 13 years old, we were doing mm -hmm. like New York state solo competitions oh, wow. and all county orchestras and all state orchestras and playing some pretty difficult classical repertoire by that age. I mean, we probably practiced more than we do in our pro careers now because you know you're always practicing more as a student but um so we we had a pretty good group back then and we gave ourselves a name and we started taking bookings for weddings and local restaurants in the summertime in buffalo they'd stick us out on the patio and i'd always i, I didn't have software you know back then i couldn't right. afford it so i drew st staff paper by hand and i'd write out oh. <laughs> cashmere for string quartet or aerosmith <laughs> for string quartet or different things like that and they'd never heard you know these kids playing rock music on, as a string quartet and so we kind of had a little reputation locally and we were doing gigs and we probably made $50 a person, but for a 12 year old, oh, yeah, that's big money. That was, that was good money for us to do a couple weddings a month or something like that. So well, the other part of it is you're a kid and they, right. I mean, I've interviewed recently the last, this past year, a 12 year old of two 15 year olds and a 16 year old musicians that are coming up. And when they start out and they come on stage or when people see them, they think, oh, what's this? And I'm sure the same thing happened to you guys. They're like, what are these girls out here? And then you start playing and they're like, oh, wait a minute. This is completely different than I expected. Yeah, it was actually a, a pretty good thing we had going. I mean, being able to teach and play gigs and make money from that beat making minimum wage flipping burgers at that oh, age, yeah. that's for sure. So or, well, you're doing you what know. you want to do. You're doing exactly yeah. what you want to do. It it was fun. So we've been we've been actually making money as musicians since we were probably in middle school. But those girls in the original group, we all went our separate ways in mm -hmm. college. And then when I ended up finishing uh, college in Buffalo and moving to Las Vegas because I got a job in Wayne Newton's uh, band. Oh, that's right. And yeah. I decided to get my master's degree here while I was working in his band. And I ended up meeting a bunch of local Vegas musicians who were in shows here, pros, you know, mm -hmm. and some of them were roughly my age and we kind of were getting our master's degrees together or, you know, we were like the up and coming musicians in town. And then there were other people who had been there a while and showed us the ropes and introduced us to people and things like that. And I got affiliated through one of these performers with Yamaha who kind of got behind me, used to bring me to the NAMM show to do demos of their electrics instruments with effects and things like that. Mm -hmm. And through my relationship with Yamaha, I started doing clinics around the country with them. And I was able to then afford to get these electric instruments, which I couldn't afford good quality electric instruments as a kid. You know, like I had some cheap eBay electric violin that sounded like garbage 
and I would just mess with it through an amplifier, but no pro quality instrument. Right. So moving to Vegas and getting affiliated with Yamaha was the first step towards the group as it is today. And um, so my friends in Vegas, we just kind of started the group. It was initially just a corporate group. Vegas is great for that. You can make a full-time living when Verizon oh, yeah. I can Visa imagine. comes to town and they have conventions and they need entertainment. And we did that with backing tracks for a long time. And then one day someone was at one of those conventions who ran a theater in New Mexico, like maybe a 600 th th seat theater, something like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. and asked me, um, you know, this is the most amazing thing. I've never seen anything like it. I have a theater. Uh, can can I book you for like, a, do you have a ticketed like a stage show, a production show? I'm like, yeah, of course we do. And so we booked it like a year out and then I wrote the show, which turned into the Femmes of Rock show, specialized uh -huh. arrangements. We we do singing in the show, medleys, uh, live band, video content, everything like that. So that was like the thing, again, kind of by fate that let us get the show started, the touring show. It's it's funny because of way, way how you went through it, because you started so young. Well, not most of the musicians I talk to start young, but they don't really become professional till later. You know, they get, if they're lucky, they, but you got the break and you know, there wasn't a break. You were good or you would have been hired by Wade Newton's people the, coming the, to Vegas. The thing about my career, I've been pretty lucky because obviously as a child, you're living with your parents, you don't have expenses or anything like that. Right. So all the money I made playing in a string quartet as a child, it was just, you know, it was great. Then as soon as I finished school, I got a job with Wayne Newton. So, and from there I worked with Tony Braxton. And from there I did some work with David Foster. So I never really had to go through this like hard knocks period of mm. driving a, a dirty van around the country. <laughs> yes, sir. Like I, I skipped that whole thing of, and went right to doing really cool gigs. The only time I went backwards on that was by choice. Like at one point in my career, when I finished my master's degree, I got really burnt out, like to kind of to the point where the movie Whiplash, I don't know if you've seen that movie. Oh, yeah. But I had to turn it off because it gave me like PTSD to watch that movie. And I was so done with the violin and I was so done with the cutthroat competition of classical music that I didn't even open my degree when it came in the mail for like two years. Oh, wow. I didn't play the violin and I ended up teaching myself bass guitar and joining a lounge band. So <laughs> I went to the lounges of Las Vegas after being on tour dates with David Foster and people <laughs> like that. And I just went to go play at O'Shea's Casino where the floor is squishy from beer and, oh. you know, people are having fights in the background. And I did that for a few years um, in a really fun uh, all request band. And I played bass and I also would bring the violin in and play a solo every now and then. But I got to be a bass player and learn a lot of songs and um, just have like some low stress fun because I was like, what's the least stressful? Who's always the coolest person in the band? Well, the bass player is bass usually player. the most chill. The only part of my career where I played like, you know, places where people got into fist fights was, <laughs> was by choice. <laughs> so. Well, it's interesting that, you know, you go through that. It's funny because people that I talk to, Either they're on, they're already professionals all the time, or some already have been doing it for a long time and well known. But there's always that that musical path that people take. Everybody's different, but they're same. You know, you start young, you get bit by the music bug, and you can't get rid of it until you're dead, because that's just what you're going to do. And and I'm sure you've had people come up to you. I mean, with me, at my age, people come up because I'm playing lead guitar in a rock band, and they're like. Oh, I used to play when I was fill in the blank, when I was 30 or 40. Oh, why don't you play now? Oh, I'm too old. No, you're not. You're not. You're only too old when you're dead. So I said, you know, you just got to keep doing because it's just something that's part of your mindset. But also in your situation, it's your job. But it seems right. to me what you do, though, is you control your destiny now because of the success of the Bella Strings and the Femme, you know, band. Other than I'm in a touring band that I have to tour, here's the 50 dates I have to do. You know, tonight we're going to be in Vegas, tomorrow we're going to be in Spokane, then we're going to go to Chicago and all that stuff where you control, you know, if you get a gig, a corporate gig in Atlanta, you can maybe pick up other things around there or say, no, we're just going to go to Atlanta. So it changes it for you. I can, it's much better business, I think. 
it it was a conscious decision that I made at some point to stop being a hired gun, mm. I guess. I spent probably almost a decade of my career performing with other artists, a lot of them really famous artists. Um, and then you're told what music to play, what to do, how to stand on stage, where to be for and when the performances are. And then you're at the mercy of when their lives change, your income changes. So if somebody yeah. gets pregnant, if somebody decides just to cut the tour short or when the tour ends, you're, you're just done. years older. That's yeah. you just gotten older, but nothing has really changed. And then you're fighting the other musicians to be the person who gets hired for the next tour, you know, and then a decade of your life goes by and you're like, what is what have I done? I, I mean, it's great. I don't, I'm so happy that I've had the opportunities to play with the artists mm -hmm. that I have, because first of all, it gave me credibility in my career. Secondly, I learned something from every artist I worked with. Every gig was a little different, required a different skill. And I think it made me capable of producing my own show by having that experience playing in other people's shows for so long. At the same time, I, don't want to be hired as a backing. I'm going to play whole notes violinist anymore. So I started saying no to those kind of gigs, even if they were with cool people. I mean, of course, like obviously if Paul McCartney <laughs> asked me to play something where I'm playing I'm, whole I'm notes, there. I would, I would yeah. still play whole notes for yeah. Paul McCartney. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but for the most part, I'm really proud of where my life has gone now because I only play music that I want to play. I'm no longer playing music that other people are telling me to play. It's like every cover that I've done on my page is music that's part of my core. These are the artists that I love that shaped my life, that influenced me as a musician. And I'm not playing anything because it's a trend or because it's something that might get me a lot of views or that it's going to pay me a lot of money. Everything that I choose to cover, it means something to me. And I feel like I'm being really authentic to what I love to do right now and um, for a long time, it was about making a career and now it's about doing what I love. And I'm to the point where I'm working on some original music as well that incorporates a lot of these guitar players that influenced me growing up into my adulthood. And, um, I don't think I would have been in a position to do that without going through what I did every step of the way. I can see though, when you're playing with different bands, they play different type of music. You know, if you're going to play with this band, they're going to play that kind of music. Of course, now everybody's doing tributes here in the Dallas area, but still, I, I can see the exposure. And and also the fact that now that you're running a successful business, that's the other thing you got going for you is that people come to you and you have such an offering of, you know, and I looked at your website and saw all the stuff that you guys can do if you want this one, that one. And the one thing I've always told my old band, we broke up during COVID, Corporate gigs are where the money is, really, when you think about it, because they don't sit around and argue about it. And then they just go, I want this. This is what I want you to do. Come up and play. And and you're, I think you're appreciated more. I, <laughs> I think that's the other thing. I think you're appreciated more. And it definitely helps make a living. And I've certainly made a living for a large portion of my life thanks to Las Vegas corporate events. For well, sure. Good Lord, you got how many things, you know. I can only imagine how many corporate events are going on in Vegas all the time. And so tell me, uh, you mentioned it, who is your, who is people you looked up as a guitarist that you, oh. you listen to, you go, oh, I, I really want to do something for them or whatever. Yeah. I spent more time as a child, uh, listening to guitar players than I did violinists. And I always kind of wanted to apply what they did to my instrument. Mm -hmm. And though there are definitely electric violinists that came before me and did a lot of cool things. I never wanted to venture towards the jazz side of it. I wanted to learn how to do things with this instrument that certain guitar players did that made people like, how did, how did they do that on that yeah. instrument? Like Jimi Hendrix and Eddie Van Halen come to mind. They defined like certain sounds and certain just techniques on their instrument or, or, or certain effects on their instrument that were you know, people tried to duplicate for, um, it's a shame that he, we didn't get to see what he would have done 10 years older, even oh, yeah. you know, with so many people. Like I always bring up Terry Kath from Chicago. Oh yeah. Love his guitar playing. He's got like this passion, this joy about his playing. And I feel like if he had lived another 10, 20 years, he probably would have been considered one of the top players. He just, you know, unfortunately,
unfortunate circumstances, but different players and different bands, I think have given me different things. Um, and they're difficult for different reasons. Like some guitar players have a real, uh, certain techniques are very difficult to duplicate. Like for Eddie Van Halen's music, that's the difficult part for me. I could learn the notes to one of his solos and mm -hmm. I can play it even on an acoustic violin. <clears throat> and after learning things like, you know, Tchaikovsky violin concerto and Paganini, <laughs> like the notes aren't hard. The yes. notes aren't hard. Right. But trying to give it the same feel and technique mm -hmm. that he did on the guitar and apply that to the violin, very difficult. I'm talking to the point where like some of the sounds and the techniques that he did that I am tried to teach myself, I tortured my family for six months <laughs> listening to absolute noise while I figured out the right technique to do it, the right combination of pedals to do it, you know? So that's the hard part for me about him is translating some of his just technical things that make him sound like him to the violin, which you can't find anyone else doing those things really now, you know, eddie like, didn't really have a lot of stuff he just overdrove his marshals and the whammy bar is what made him famous and you know that's that's where he could control that and uh, of course he was the one he said if i remember right he said he didn't invent tapping it's just that he right. got into it more but he certainly and, had a command of his instrument he oh, had absolutely. a joy of playing he had um amazing technical ability on his instrument and, uh, you know, I enjoy watching a lot of his improv stuff as well. That's not the the record cut. Um, there's other guitar players like um, like the Firth of Fifth solo from Genesis. I don't know how deep you go into prog music, but I know I know about I know. it. Yeah. Yeah. So like that's just like a gut wrenching solo. It hits you. It stays there. And it's like ext you, the notes aren't hard, but catching that emotion is hard and that's one that i'm going to be putting out soon i haven't actually put that one out yet and like some of alex lifeson's solos in rush oh, you know yeah. i did the limelight solo on violin um la villa strangiato that was the song that kind of hooked me for rush when i was in college like just the same kind of thing i kind of grouped those solos in a similar category for me they're they hit you in the gut and they stay there and you carry them with you you know and it's a different kind of learning to cover those solos than it is to cover Eddie Van Halen's solos. Um, and they're difficult for different ways. So, and then like Jimmy Page is difficult for a whole different way, <laughs> yeah. but I learned something from everybody that I try to cover. And I think it's helped me form my own style of playing for my music by learning all of these things from these guitar players. Well, that's what people, when they listen to mine, they go, they try to figure out my influences. <clears throat> and I said, and they go, oh, I hear a little of this. I hear a little, well, of course, I've heard all those people play. And you just pick up some of that stuff as you go along. Then hopefully you develop your own style when you do it. And, you know, it's it's like when you do Limelight, I mean, lime, you know, the this Rush song. I know those solos. You hear the solos because as a lead guitar player, I know I'm waiting for the, the whammy thing to go down and him popping a string and all this stuff. It's like... Is he going to be able to do that live? You know, and it's like, yes, he does it live. Well, he did. And I want to talk about your instruments that you play. The one that looks like, and I see him hanging back there, that looks, is it like a guitar? Is it strung like the six string? Is not? No. It's completely different. So tell me about that. How do the string arrangements are on those? I have one of them right here next okay. to me. This is a six string. I, I have a five, a six, and a seven string. Okay. And this one has real frets on it and it's a six string violin. So the top four strings, E, A, D, G, mm -hmm. the exact same as an acoustic violin. And then you just keep going down. It, the violin is tuned in fifths. So okay. it's tuned differently than a sure, guitar. guitar. So the low yeah. strings are F, uh, C, F and C, and then G, D, A, E, just like a regular violin. So when I need to have the full range of a guitar, I'll tune this F string down to an E. e. Like I did that when I covered like Purple Haze so that I can get down to that low. And mm -hmm. in a lot of the guitar solos that I need the full range of the guitar, I'll play the six string and I'll tune. But then I'd say maybe like a third of the solos I cover, I figure out my own tuning for this. So I'll tune the strings all different depending on what I need to do to make wow. it sound like the guitar part. Because like you even think of something as simple as like, 
you know, the really nasty, dirty Angus Young solo, not the hardest notes or anything to learn, no. but making it sound like him because the fingerings are different on a guitar to be able to get those bends and slides. I have to think of really creative ways to even make those simple notes sound like the way that he played them because all the fingerings are, are different. Oh yeah. They'd be completely different. I mean, you're playing, you're a guitarist. So, yeah. you know, with me, I just listened to, uh, you know, Keith Richards always turns to G, but that's what yeah. he always plays a lot, plays in G. And I've talked to other people who do alternate tunings. I do a few D and G, but then if you're like, you're saying, if you're going to do a solo and you're listening to Jimmy Page and you go, okay, it's there, but it's really here. It's not there. It's here. Right. And so you have to think about it completely different. Yeah. And as a, it's, and as a guitar totally player different. too, that's got to, I mean, it would drive me crazy. Because I think that's one thing about alternate tunings. And then when you got that, so those strings on there, are they, then they're actually made for the violin, the one These you're are holding. violin strings. Yeah, okay. except the lowest strings, like on the seven and six string, those are kind of custom made strings, like cut short from, uh, you know, bass, like uh -huh. contrabass okay. strings. And um, they're custom made. You can't even really buy them anywhere. But the rest of the strings are are violin strings. Uh, the frets on this instrument are real. I have a combination of various fretless and fretted violins, and I use mm -hmm. them for different things. And a lot of people don't understand that. Like people who comment on my videos are like, oh, you're cheating. Well, guess what? Like <laughs> you're going to play this instrument. Let me just show you something. You're going to play a solo where your fingers are moving like at roughly this speed. Yeah. You don't have time to look and see if your fingers no. are on each one of the frets. You no. need to know how to play the violin and it's actually harder to play a fretted violin for me, much harder to play. I had to slide up to the it. instrument like a brand new instrument to learn how to play this. Yeah. You actually play on top of the frets. You don't play in between them because how would you play in between these tiny, tiny little? Oh, yeah, you up? couldn't. Yeah. And you have to play with a really light touch so that your hand can still glide and slide and do vibrato and things like that. Um, so. I use the frets for certain guitar techniques. Uh, I can't do tapping on a violin without the frets. I have an easier time doing pinch harmonic type sounds with mm -hmm. the frets. Mm -hmm. When I'm playing something that doesn't require a specific guitar technique, I prefer a fretless violin because it's easier for me yeah. to play well. I mean, it's it's harder to play a fretted violin. So people who think like, oh, you're cheating, it's simple. Well, you know what? I, I have a master's degree in classical <laughs> violin. I don't need the frets, <laughs> but I do need them to play like Eddie Van Halen. So, you well, know. Well, but the other part of it for me was, and I was just talking about a promotion company today. I said, I, I was visiting with you today and talking about how good you were. And I said, the really thing that was, I, I, I watch people like you, you never look at the fretboard. I mean, you're so trained that you kind of, you know where it is. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure part of that is because you spent hours working on something that you know. Well, where yeah, it, the muscle know. memory, again, when you do it from childhood, the muscle memory yeah. is there. I learned bass and guitar later. So you'll see in some of the videos where I'm playing other instruments, I will look at the fretboard because I don't have those thousands and thousands of hours playing mm -hmm. a guitar to just be able to go like this. Yeah. And on a violin, I can just go like this. So you'll see, while I do play some of those instruments on the backing track parts to my solos that I cover, you'll see me peek down more often on those <laughs> instruments than I will on a violin. Well, there's some famous people that still look at their frets. I mean, there's people that do that still. I mean, it's, it, I don't, that doesn't change the skill set for me. I've always, I always wanted to get to a point where I could just stand and look at people doing a lead break and not look down at my, you know. Whether anybody else thinks it's cool, I do, because it's like, I know how hard it is to get all that muscle memory, like you said, to be able to do it. Now, the the instruments that you play like that one, with those, are those that something you can go out and buy? Or did you have to work with the company and manufacturers and say, this is what I want? You can buy those instruments. The, the ones that look like flying bees, those are uh, Mark Wood Vipers. And so Mark Wood is a famous electric violinist. He played with Trans-Siberian Orchestra and uh -huh. he patented this design where you don't need a chin rest and you have the, you know, the frets and the flying V design. And so those, you can buy them, but they are custom order. And there's, there's a way to get a custom oh, sure. one. So they'll, you can get them custom painted. You can get them custom made with the number of strings. You can get real frets. You can get phantom frets that are not real frets, or you can get them just totally fretless. But I think my seven string, it was a, more than a year wait to have it custom oh, wow. made. Yeah. Um, and then the Yamahas that I play, 
uh, the, the one that I played like on comfortably numb, the white one, that one is out of production. So unfortunately, if you're going to buy that one, you have to find, find one like on eBay or something like that. But I still perform on that violin. It's one of my favorites for tone and the, the ease of playing on the fingerboard. Cause I have a small, really small hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the brown Yamaha, the YEV that I play in some of my videos, you can just go out and buy one of those. And I always recommend that for beginners because it's like 600 and something dollars. It's not an expensive yeah. electric violin, but it's pro quality. Like you can still get a really good pro quality and it's really affordable. So when people are like, what should I buy? I'm like that one as a beginner, you're that's starting. what you should buy. You don't need yeah. this, you know, something crazy if you're just starting out. So has anybody from the famous songs that you've done, has anybody ever contact you and say, I heard that, I like it? Does anybody? Yes, Who's... actually. Um, so uh, let's see. Early on, uh, Richie Sambora heard my cover of uh, Living on a Prayer, and he yeah. retweeted it on, on well, I guess it was still Twitter at the time. Yeah. And um, uh, Peter Frampton actually just shared my uh, Do You Feel solo on his x page and on mm. his facebook page and sent me a really nice uh you know compliment amount it and um alex lifeson heard limelight via his sister who found the video and showed it to him and and he actually contacted me as well with some really nice compliments about it and he left a, a comment on the instagram video of limelight <laughs> and the funny thing is like even though he left the comment like the person right after him in the comments was like you're just miming to the original. I'm like, do you see the guy right above you that left the comment? That is the original. He knows that I'm not miming to him. Why don't you know? So it's it's funny, it's funny how people, I was watching one of these, uh, the guy out of the Netherlands has got like 3 million people to follow him. He teaches guitar, he always does things. He's talking about Paul Simon. And he had, he had written out the chords for 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, right? So he just put this up last week. And he said, I get a, I get an email from one of Paul's people. And he's it's like his engineer said, hey, Paul wants to talk to you about something. So he goes, OK, here's my contact info. And he wrote it back. He said that that chord you made, it's not right. <laughs> so he was listening, watched the video. Paul that's Simon funny. says, that's the wrong chord. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, I felt so small. <laughs> well, so far, no one's pointed out any wrong. No, notes. I'm not saying you know, that, but I'm it's sure just sure that it's... I've had wrong notes in some of my covers. But so far, it's been from the original artists. I've had positive experiences with um, with everybody. And um, like Randy Rhodes sister complimented the oh, crazy yeah, train solo right. that I did. Oh, yeah, and, um, I saw that. Uh, yeah. Michael Anthony from Van Halen complimented my beat it solo. And, you know, Panama, I did another uh, Eddie Van Halen cover. So um, I have heard from some of the like original people about it them. must and make you feel good though. It must make you feel good that you're two things. One, they're actually watching your videos, somebody or somebody told them about it. And number two, they liked you well enough to know that they actually like Peter is sending you a note yeah. saying, you know, that, that has to mean a lot to you because you, it's not something even at the, the quality and the experience that you have, you still have to spend some time working on these things to make oh, them yeah. sound it's, as close as you do. So it's a lot of work think, to make a 30 oh, yeah. second video. It's a lot of learning. Yeah. But yeah, for sure. I, I mean, and especially because like I said before, I'm not playing anything that I don't love. So the things that I am playing, these artists mm -hmm. mean a lot to me. And so when I get to hear from them, these are my heroes that as a kid, or as a college student, as an impressionable musical mind, these are the people that I listen to. So to hear from them directly has been really special and, you know, kind of humbling that these videos have had the reach that they have, that these people have seen them on social media. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the whole thing is kind of because of COVID. Prior to COVID, I toured with other artists as a hired gun. And I had my own touring show that I was just getting off the ground mm -hmm. and I played out live. I didn't have a social media presence because I was out gigging. You didn't have time. All the time. You didn't have time. Yeah. And so when COVID happened and um, I couldn't tour anymore, uh, I also happened to be nine months pregnant and had <laughs> both of us lost our income. So that was a Ooh. whole nother stress level at that time. But years after that, now it's turned out to be like, kind of a cool thing because I started doing these covers during COVID 
of stuff that I would do live in my show. So mm -hmm. it's like, well, you can't come see me do it live in the show. So I'll put it on social media. And the good part about it is it's grown the awareness for my show. And I've reached all these people that I never would have thought I would have reached. The bad part is the audience on social media is not the same as the audience that watches me live. So I spent, you know, 10 years of my career, never having someone call me a phony. And then now all of a sudden, because I'm putting videos on social media, fake phony, <laughs> you're miming to the original. I'm like, well, come see the real show, you know? That's so the one a, thing about social media. I tell people, look, I said, you know, when you, when you get comments from a video you shot a year or two years ago, and all they want to do is saying something nasty about it. It's like, don't watch it. I mean, you know, yeah. if you don't like what I'm doing, don't want you talk too much. Or I didn't like this. Your mustache. Don't watch me. Why? You know, it's like, what? Well, that's what people don't understand. They're like, some people will come to my videos and they'll be like, I hate the violin. It sounds like garbage. <laughs> the guitar sounds better. And I'm, and so I'll like sometimes leave a comment. I'll be like, you know what? by commenting on this video, you're showing the algorithm that you interact with violin videos. So it's gonna show you even more violin videos. All you have to do is click the X on top that says hide the video and you won't see any more violin videos. But they think that by saying something nasty, what all uh, that's doing is gonna show them more videos because they're stupid and they don't know how the internet works. No, I, I just, and some of them I've just get rid of because it's like, I can, some of them I've left up if they're not too bad, but some of them are just stupid. It's like, okay, I'm going to remove this comment because I don't care about it. It's just not, you're not I hit back a lot of the time and sometimes engage with people. Sometimes if it seems like something borderline uh, dangerous, I definitely block oh, yeah. it. I don't engage with it. So. so where are you going from here now? I mean, okay. So you don't, you don't are not one. I think you you're saying you're working on some new music, but you're not really the kind of person I hear on, you know, people's playlists or, you know, you're not big on the, Hey, I need to get a label deal. I mean, I know you're doing very well what you do. So, and you've got, I, I think what you do is brilliant where you're taking the ladies and going out and doing it. And so you're going to start back and do you go out for a very long time? Obviously you got kids, so you can't go well, gone too long, but you know, What's the yeah, situation I, I now? I don't want to be gone too long unless it was something really special, like something I really, really wanted to do. I'm happy doing spot dates where you do go out for a weekend, do a Friday, Saturday, go home. Because like I said, I mean, at this point, you, you I don't, yeah, I have small children. I don't want to be away for too long. But also yeah. if I get away from what I focus on, for too long, then again, it's no different than going out on the road as a hired gun with a famous person. And then you're just 10 years older and the stuff you want to get done doesn't get done. So I have to be in the studio a certain amount of time and not traveling on airplanes. And plus just like the travel since COVID is, I know wants to I do know. it. Nobody wants to do it. <laughs> so I'm happy doing spot dates, doing fly in and fly out here and there, not doing like a really long tour. It would have to be a super special situation for me to go out and do a really long tour or something like that. But uh, where I go from here, um, so the parts of how I make a living, the Bella Strings is my corporate group. I no longer perform in it. I used to. I manage it, I book it, and I produce all of the musical content for it. This is probably like, you know, 70% of my time is oh, managing wow. that group. Wow. So- Prior to COVID, they're doing 250 dates a year, wow. providing string related musical entertainment all over North America, mm. sometimes in Europe, doing private events. So that's like a behind the scenes thing that it's not like the thing I'm known for, but I spend a lot of my time doing it. Then there's the Femmes of Rock touring show, which I still perform in and I still write the music for. And, um, you know, obviously getting uh, more dates for the femmes and better dates, better shows in better venues and building the audience and awareness for that show is something that, um, you know, I aim to do. And then, um, you know, I might eventually do some solo shows as well where I feature things that I'm doing. But the, the big thing on my timeline right now is I've done almost everything I want to do except release my own music. And well, how come I'm not on Spotify? Well, cause I've spent my whole life <laughs> playing gigs, just playing music and booking shows and managing bands and doing live stuff. 
So it just always was like, oh, well, maybe when that's done, I'll be less busy and I'll do it. And maybe I've been writing music since I was 13 years old. Oh, I sure. have journals of songs that I've written, some instrumental, some, you know, with lyrics, different styles and things like that. And I think, um, you know, there are two big guitar solos that I'm working on that I'm going to do special music videos for that are covers. And at that point, I feel like I'm going to be ready to launch into some original stuff. And I have everything I need here to record. You know, I don't really need to go find some great label. No. And, you know, uh, usually with my tracks here, I engineer myself and I get it to where I can get it. Rody's really good at at final mixes and stuff like that. And so I'll hand them off to him to do like the final mix of the, the video right. audio before like I put it out. Saw it. Yeah, the master so like saw I said, it. like he's he's good at that. I, I can I have good equipment here. I, you know, I mean, what else do I need to record electric violin really? But if I had the opportunity to work with like, you know, a serious producer that understands the vision for this thing, like I would not want to go get on a label or get a producer just to go use someone's studio. That wouldn't be something that would entice me to add someone else into my solo project. Right. It would need to be somebody who like get really gets what I'm trying to do and that can really well, help you're such a unique force. you're, you're so, a unique person you're a neat unique what you do and uh you know being a producer uh, it's always nice to have other people but if they don't have the same thought process that you then there's no point in having them there and like you said you can do all the stuff at your house right there wherever you you know the studio yeah as long as you got everything you need with pro tools or whatever you use and then you got the the stuff on it and, and if the music is good, it will find its way. That's the way I feel oh, yeah. about it. If the content I put out is good, I'm building my social media audience with these cover songs that I'm doing, and it builds weekly. You know, I, sometimes it'll build 10,000 fans a week on Facebook when I put out a video. So it's like it, it's it's growing. Um, it's not growing as fast as it could be if I was doing this full time. I'm trying to plunk out these videos in between all the other things I'm responsible for. But still, I feel like if my original music is good, the people who are following me now will spread it to more people and the right people will hear it. And sure. fate, fate has been the story of my career so far. And I feel like good things will happen if I put out something that's authentic to me that I've worked hard on into the world. That's been my motto. Just do what you do well and make sure that it's authentic to you and that you're not doing what other people think you should do, that you just do what what you feel you like do. you love. Yeah, everyone will know. Your audience will know you're a fraud. Everybody will know you're a fraud if you're doing what other people tell you will make you successful and it's not in your heart to do that. So yes, the original album, which I would say probably around the first of the year, I'm going to be serious about working on that. That's going to be something that I'm going to put a lot of time into and um, something that will be really unique that I don't think a lot of violinists have put out things that sound like that. Look forward to seeing you in person sometime. All right. Have a Thank good day. Nice Take care. Nice meeting you too. Thanks for the time.